Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Tim Vollmer from the UC Berkeley Library. And my colleague, Rachel Sandberg, is here. And Rachel is the Scarlet Communication Officer and Program Director at the library. Um, as you just heard with the chime, we're recording the presentation part of the workshop today. And we'll make the recording, the slides, and the slide transcript available to everyone after today. So this workshop is sponsored by the Office of Scholarly Communication Services within the library. And in general, we're here to help answer questions around a variety, a variety of different issues, including copyright in your research, um, publishing and teaching, author's rights and protecting and managing your intellectual property, um, scholarly publishing options and platforms, uh, open access to research, open data, open educational resources, and a lot more. So this week, we've been hosting a series of publishing related workshops aimed at graduate students and postdocs. Um, so yesterday, we hosted a session on what you need to know with regard to copyright and other legal considerations for your dissertation. Um, both in how to incorporate other people's content within your writing and also your rights as an author and how you can share out your dissertation. Uh, but today we're focusing on some strategies and tools for managing and maximizing the scholarship that you create and want to share. And then on Thursday, we'll be moderating a panel discussion to explore what the process is for taking a dissertation and turning it into your first book. So on Thursday, we're gonna hear from an acquisitions editor from the University of California Press. Uh, we're also gonna hear from a professor here, here at Berkeley who recently had her first book published. And then finally, we're gonna hear from a legal expert from the nonprofit Authors Alliance. Uh, and uh, she will outline some of the things that authors should think about when they're negotiating with publishers. Uh, then we're gonna take a break for a few weeks and then come back with another workshop on copyright and fair use for digital projects. That's gonna be on November 10th. And then finally on December 1st, we're gonna have one on sharing and publishing research data. So if you want to register for any of those workshops, um, you can visit our website. Uh, the link is on the screen here. And like I said, we'll be sharing these slides out later so you can see it there as well. Next slide. So let's take a look at what we have in store for today. Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about why impact matters in the first place um, and what measures of impact can do and what they can't do. Second, we're going to explore a variety of metrics for measuring the impact of your scholarship. Third, we'll highlight some useful platforms and practices you can experiment with in order to get your research seen and make an impact. And then finally, we'll save some time for questions at the end um, or have a discussion on a particular piece that's of greatest interest to you all. So if you have questions as we're going along, you should feel free to add them to the Zoom chat. And Rachel and I will be monitoring the chat as we go along and we can answer the questions at the end. So before we begin, we'd like for each of you to think about one thing that you want to get accomplished this year regarding creating or sharing a piece of your research. Now, of course, we know that the pandemic has really thrown us all for a loop and it might be negatively affecting your writing and collaboration with your colleagues. You know, research may be slowed down and there might be fewer opportunities to share work because no one's hosting in-person events or your colleagues might be spread around and you're not able to work as effectively as you could before. It's okay. Sometimes we have to temper our expectations and our goals for creating and sharing research and scholarship. But with this in mind, we'd like everyone to just take a minute and think, think and, and make a note and share it in the chat if you'd like. You know, what is one goal that you have with your scholarship for this year? What are you planning to create? Is your goal to complete your thesis? Um, are you looking to file your dissertation? Uh, do you want to write an academic article and have it accepted for publication in a journal? Um, is your goal to share your research via a poster session or a presentation at a virtual conference? 
Um, or do you want to collaborate with other researchers on a project or experiment this year? Um, maybe this is something that you're already working on. Um, maybe it's something that you've been thinking about, but you haven't started yet. But please take a minute. And like I said, if you feel comfortable, please share it with us in the chat so we can get a sense of what sorts of things people are working on. Okay, great. Thanks for people for sharing. It sounds, looks like a few people are working on their dissertations, some academic articles, uh, one per semester. That's fantastic. All right, another dissertation, uh, journal article. Okay, great. Eduardo's working on a conference paper. Y'all are busy. <laughs> it's impressive. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing those. Uh, well, with this in mind, let's let's sort of proceed with the with the bulk of the workshop. So, we're here today to talk about um, what it means to have impact as a scholar, and how you can actually measure and monitor the impact that you have. So let's first think about why we're even having this conversation. So, you know, why should you care about your impact as a, as a scholar? Well, if you're an author, you know, you want to know who's reading your work, who's citing it, and if they're citing it, what they actually think about it. Uh, you may want to know if a particular journal you're thinking about submitting an article to is reputable and high quality. And you may need to be able to show a promotion and tenure committee that your work is important and that it means something to other scholars in your field, or that has some kind of policy or real world impact as well. But we can't just focus on ourselves as researchers and authors. We should recognize what other stakeholders in the research and publication life cycle feel is important about impact too. They might not be you, but they will affect you, they'll affect your career, and they'll affect the field that you're in. So what might an institution like UC Berkeley want to know about impact? Well, it might want to know how much research is being published on this campus um, and how that research has been received by the academic community and the public. It might need to show the UC regions or donors or state or federal government that high quality work is being conducted by, by researchers on our campus. And these measurements of impact might affect how departments get supported and how funds get allocated on campus. Uh, another audience is if you're a funding agency, like say the National Institutes of Health or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you'd want to know if the projects that you're funding are accomplishing what they set out to do. And these foundations want to know whether their grant funds are being well spent. Next slide. So impact is important to a range of stakeholders for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, but for the author or researcher, what can measuring impact really do for you? Well, measuring impact can provide indicators of your overall productivity. It can demonstrate reasons why a faculty member should get a promotion or be granted tenure. It can point to the value of research to support applications for grant funding or to demonstrate that grant funding has been well invested. It can provide insights that can be useful for readers and the audiences that you're writing for. They can help identify potential collaborators within your field, both locally and also at other institutions. Measures of impact can help you discover who is engaging with, with your work and provide mechanisms for ensuring that you as an author gets cited and receives credit for your work. And overall, paying attention to impact can help you manage your reputation as an academic. But of course, measure of the impact can't do everything. So they can't always tell you everything about the quality of an article or the quality of a journal or a publisher. They won't necessarily indicate whether an author has been successful in their research. And they can't tell the whole story about the reach of a particular publication. One reason for these limitations is that impact and engagement 
can mean different things to different people and different disciplines. Another reason is that measuring and counting itself is really hard. For example, an article citation count that you pull from an index is obviously only going to count articles that are in that index. So we have to understand the limitations of measuring and use metrics in smart and transparent ways. Next, we'll get into more detail about how to measure impact appropriately by exploring some of the common types of metrics. Hey, so there are a lot of metrics out there, um, but first I wanted to give you a quick lay of the land for the types of metrics that you might encounter in your scholarly work. Today, we're gonna to talk about author level metrics, journal level metrics, article level metrics, metrics about data, code, and software, and what's considered alt metrics, which stands for alternative metrics. These different metrics can help you evaluate yourself or tell your story to different audiences. For example, a journal's impact might help you decide where to publish. A promotion and tenure committee might instead be interested in your overall impact as an author, but you might be concerned with the impact or citation rate of a particular paper you wrote. And metrics only measure specific things. As Tim said, they can't always tell the whole story about an academic publication or a particular article or you as an author or person. So first, we're gonna start out by digging in a bit more to understand how each of these different types of metrics work. We're gonna start with author level metrics. At the author level, metrics are focused on basic activities associated with your productivity. And from the sound of everything that you've been putting in chat so far, everyone's very busy. Um, author level metrics include things like how many publications you have or how many citations your overall set of publications have received. Author metrics can also include journal counts, for example, the how many different journals that you've published in, or the range of journal discipline categories where, you, where your work has appeared. This can be useful for tracking the breadth and the reach of your scholarship. No one author metric is going to be perfect for telling your story, particularly as an early career researcher. For instance, within author level metrics, you might have heard of the H index. H index is a metric that attempts to measure both your productivity, that is how many articles you've published, and your citation impact, meaning how many times those articles have been cited. The definition of the index is that a scholar with an index of H has published H papers, each of which has been cited in other papers at least H times. So to translate that, an H index of five means that an author has published five papers that have each received at least five citations in other papers. It's believed that after 20 years of research, an H index of 20 is good, 40 is outstanding, and 60 is truly exceptional. But there are some limitations to the H index as there are for all author level metrics. For example, with early career researchers or new faculty, obviously the H index is not going to be an accurate measure of your productivity because you haven't had time to write lots of papers yet. So it biases towards more experienced faculty. Another limitation of H index and author level metrics generally is that it's really hard to compare numbers across disciplines because publishing frequencies in, and publishing practices can vary so much. For example, in biomedical research fields, perhaps there's a higher expectation of multiple articles published per year than in your field of research. Let's say in, in the arts and humanities, potentially journal articles aren't even something as, as highly pertinent every year as publishing a monograph. So your overall journal numbers are lower and thus so is your H index. I hate to say it, but journal level metrics are not a perfect solution either. Um, we'll talk about these now. At, at the journal level, some of you have probably heard uh, one of the key journal level metrics called journal impact factor. And that's used as an indicator to evaluate journals. The journal impact factor is essentially a measurement of a journal's average number of citations to recent articles published in that journal, typically over the previous two year period. So for example, how many times have other articles cited an article from a particular journal over the past two years. Traditionally, an author being able to state that an article 
articles published in a journal with a high impact factor was a marker for the importance of a given article in the field, and thus by extension shows the individual scholar had produced valuable work. But journal impact factor tends to be a controversial metric because it's often misused as an author metric to assess an author's success by the impact factor of the journal they published in. So for example, it's sort of like guilt by association, um, kind of the reverse. Um, you publish in a particular journal and you're perceived as having, your article is perceived as having more impact merely because of the journal it was published in. Journal metrics are also problematic because they don't necessarily tell you anything about the quality or importance of the individual article published within a journal. It's really about the journal's prestige and not about your particular article within the journal. And as with author level metrics, they're daunting for junior researchers because the advice that journal editors often give early career researchers is to submit your articles to journals in which you have a realistic chance of being published. This may mean trying to let go of notions about journal prestige as you start out in order to make sure you get published. Okay, then there's article level metrics. Article level metrics attempt to provide a snapshot of how an individual article is being discussed, shared, and cited. At the article level, citation counts, that is the number of times your article is cited in another article or book, can be a good indicator of uptake by the scholarly community. But they don't tell the whole story. For instance, a new article, let's say you published something within the past two to three years, that might be very popular, but it still might not have as many citation counts as an article that's had five years to accrue citations, especially given the very long cycle from when a journal article is submitted for consideration to when it's actually published. Many publishers are also beginning to track other kinds of engagement with articles besides just purely citations. For example, web page views, number of downloads, how often an article is bookmarked, social media activities such as Twitter and Facebook mentions and the like. Now, whether or not a promotion and tenure committee is going to care about those things is entirely separate. But these additional indices can help round out the story of how people are responding to your article. But again, as with all of the other metrics, there are limitations on the use of article level metrics. Engagement can mean different things to different audiences. For example, an article could have a lot of views, but what does that mean in terms of how it affects future scholarship and knowledge? And social media coverage could be explosive, but all negative. Um, and also some disciplines are focused more on things that are not articles, for example, monographs in the humanities or patents in chemistry. There are also metrics for data code and software and they're growing in number and there are also an increasing variety of tools to help track how people are engaging with these non article based outputs. If you publish data sets in dryad and it'd be great if and if someone wants to, to note in chat if they've ever published their data set before. Um, if you've ever published data sets in dryad, which is UC's data publishing service available to all of you, by the way. Um, you can get statistics on how many people are downloading your data sets and ultimately how many people are citing them. Data and software platforms like GitHub are widely used for collaboration and making the code widely available. Some of the metrics that you can use these tools to track include the number of downloads, the number of forks or collaborators or watchers on places like GitHub. And this is a great way to get credit for the hard work you've put into data collection, even if you haven't published the formal paper yet. As with the other metrics, there are some limitations. Um, some of the same as before, as some disciplines collecting and sharing data, um, doing that is more prevalent than in others. Another is that this is a relatively new area for tracking scholarly impact. So it's not necessarily as well accepted in terms of promotion and tenure as some of the other established metrics in academia that we looked at. And lastly, there are alt metrics, short for alternative metrics. This is a slightly different category of metrics. There's a growing number of tools and plugins that can track the various kinds of attention that your work might be getting in a number of different spheres and from many different data sources, not necessarily all of them scholarly. 
Altmetrics tools are going to track different types of activities and then they kind of bundle them together with a score that provide an overall sense for the reach that your work has gotten. Some of the altmetric sources include things like mentions on social media, mentions in mainstream news or other online news sites, exports to citation management systems like Zotero, downloads of full text articles, mentions of research and public policy documents, comments in blogs or other online forums, citations in Wikipedia articles, references in patent applications. Now, there are some really great strengths of altmetrics, including speed. Remember, we talked about how hard it is for things like your um, journal citations to accrue in the first two years, given uh, the length of time it takes for other scholarly articles to be published that cite you. Well, that's not the case with altmetrics. They can be gathered and calculated immediately compared with regular traditional citations that accumulate slowly. Another strength is diversity. Altmetrics capture data from a variety of scholarly sources beyond just the traditional academic publishing setting. And, and that can reflect a broader impact of your research. But as with the others, there are limitations. One challenge is understanding what does attention really mean and, and how attention to your scholarship translates to impact for your scholarship. Again, just like with article level metrics, attention could be negative um, and you don't necessarily want that kind of impact. Also money, some altmetrics tools are proprietary and in fact, Altmetrics itself, this little donut bubble that you see here, um, has also just become proprietary and they're not necessarily accessible to everyone without a subscription. Even the recently, you know, as I just mentioned, even Altmetrics, which is leading the, the charge here, has, has gone in this direction. If you want to explore some more into all of these metrics that we just talked about, we recommend checking out metricstoolkit.org. Um, it provides a really useful summary and allows you to really kind of dig into the different metrics tools to see which might be most useful for your needs. Okay, so quickly to sum up our discussion of metrics and turn to the really fun stuff in this presentation. Um, for better or worse, metrics are an important part of the scholarly system in which we operate. A few points to sum them up. There are different types of metrics. At the author level, we took a look at H index. At the journal level, we looked at something called journal impact factor. At the article level, we looked at citation counts. Within data and code, we looked at tools that capture downloads, adoption, and forks. And we looked at altmetrics, which track broad attention across a variety of sources. As, as we've mentioned, metrics can't tell you everything, but they can um, sometimes help tell a picture or paint a picture of your entire work. It's always more useful to rely on more than one metric as opposed to being evaluated or evaluating yourself based on just one. Okay, so if, if you have if had any thoughts that came to you as you were thinking about um, metrics when we were discussing them, think back to your publishing goal that we, we talked about at the beginning of the workshop, all of the things you're working on, and try to think about which of these metrics would be most useful for you to kind of aim for or track in the context of what your scholarship goal is for the year. I'm going to put the metrics ecosystem slide back up for a minute so uh, you, it can help you in this process. And again, if you feel like sharing in chat um, what sounds good to you, that's great. Yeah, deciding where to submit articles is um, 
seemingly very daunting, but we have a, a bunch of good strategies for working with journal level metrics on our website. And that can, that can help you distill what might be the best fits for you, especially starting out. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tim. Great, thanks, Rachel. Uh, so let's move on to the next part of the workshop. Here, we're gonna have a look at a few different tools and tips that you can use to help manage your scholarly profile and also to maximize the impact for your research. Now, for sure, generating impact starts with uh, rigorous research and careful scholarly publishing practices. But let's also be honest, it's also about sharing and promoting your research. So listen to this from Toby Green, who's the former head of publishing and impact measurement at the OECD. He writes, I can hear many of you now, but I'm too busy to promote my papers. Let's put this in context. If you've spent many months, even years, gathering data, writing up the results, and getting a paper through the publishing process, isn't it worth spending time on making sure your findings reach beyond your immediate peer group? A launch and leave approach, where you do some promotion when a paper is launched, and then leave the scene hoping an audience will develop by itself, is highly unlikely to generate much impact and means you're going to get a poor return on the investment you made in writing a paper in the first place. So we know it's not easy or comfortable to promote yourself, but pushing yourself to do this even a little bit, it can be extremely helpful for spreading the word about your work and positioning yourself as a productive contributor in your field. And one way to think about it is you're not using these communications platforms to brag about yourself, but you're speaking up about the issues that of interest to you and to your community and engaging in conversations with other people about these topics. So you need to think about ways to make your research findable and accessible to your audiences and potentially beyond. There are many things to consider to help your research generate the impact you want. Now, you've already thought a bit about a publishing goal for this next year, and soon it'll be time to make a plan for dissemination and interaction with your community. So one thing you'll want to think about are the audiences for your work. These can include um, related researchers in your field, other professionals, students, policymakers, or even the general public. And if you know your intended audience, it'll make it easier to find the best fit journals and publishing venues. And when you're scanning potential journals for publishing, it can be helpful to review the journal's scope and submission criteria and to compare that to whom you believe your intended audience is. Now, of course, there are so many journals out there. And at the end of the day, you should write for your audience and publish in the sources that they're reading. But also be in communication with your peers, both within your department and also at other schools. You know, where are they publishing? What are the norms and best practices for publishing within your discipline? Ask your peers and they'll likely share this with you. Also, what does your faculty advisor recommend? And are there possibilities for collaboration and joint publishing? But overall, it's important to make a publishing plan and then use that to guide your research dissemination. So now let's talk a bit about tools and platforms to manage your research persona. First off, let's talk about scholarly profiles. So a scholarly profile is a platform or service that communicates distinct information about you as a researcher. And profiles can include a variety of personal and professional information, including things like institutional connections, your prior education, work history, projects, your publishing history, and many other aspects. But the most important point of a robust scholarly profile is that it unambiguously communicates that you are the person who's done the research. They can do this by integrating with persistent identifiers so you can keep track of and manage your scholarship. So we'll highlight some options for setting up a scholarly profile. And we will also explore a few other types of social profiles that can be useful in getting your research noticed by other people. 
So the first is ORCID, and ORCID is a persistent identifier for researchers. It's similar to a social security number for scholars. And by that, I mean it's a unique identifier associated with you and only you. You can use an ORCID to associate your name with your work, so it's uniquely tied to you and can't be confused with work authored by someone, someone else, potentially someone with the same name or similar name as yours. This is also important for impact tracking, like pulling citations and helping to ensure you get proper credit for what you do. Many publishers, funders, and platforms are now integrating with ORCID so that if you're submitting a paper for publication or applying for a grant, you enter your ORCID number and it can automatically link up to your ID and also to the work that you're doing. So it's free to get an ORCID and it only takes a couple of minutes to set up. So we have ORCID for people, us as researchers, uh, but what about publications and other research assets? So for that, there are digital object identifiers shortened to DOIs. A DOI is a type of persistent identifier used to uniquely identify digital objects such as scholarly articles, chapters, or data sets. And a DOI functions like a URL where a particular object can be found. And the value of the DOI is that the identifier remains fixed over the lifetime of the digital object, even if you later change the particular URL where the article is hosted. Now, of course, every time a URL changes, the publisher has to update the metadata for the DOI to link to the new URL. So publishers and repositories often assign DOIs to each of your publications just for this reason. And here on the slide is the ORCID profile of the publications of a UC Berkeley faculty member, Philip Stark. And you can see each of his publications has a DOI attached to it. So I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with Google Scholar, which of course is the search engine for scholarly articles. Um, you can also set up your Google Scholar profile. This profile functions more as a showcase for your publications and citations, and it shows the article name, where it's been published, when it was published, and how many times it's been cited. Then there are some types of scholarly profiles that are more subject specific. Uh, and these aim to create community and discussion within a particular discipline. So here's a platform called Humanities Commons and it's aimed at humanities researchers. And the site does a few different things. First, it functions as a collaboration space for different projects and groups. It's a place where scholars can publish early versions of their work. Um, it also allows you to set up a scholarly profile if you want. So you can do things like follow other people, or you can just use it as a static profile to feature your interests and your publications. You can also see here that you can link it up to other profiles like your ORCID ID or Twitter account. Then there are research sharing sites like academia.edu and ResearchGate. These platforms are a bit more about content sharing than social interaction, sort of another place to put copies of your research and try to get an audience. So academia.edu has almost 140 million users now and ResearchGate has 17 million. So the network effects are decent on these sites and it's likely a good idea to maintain a profile for contact, at least as a way to support, professional, uh, support your professional presence online. But one thing to keep in mind about these sites, both of these sites are technically businesses, even though academia.edu uses the .edu top level domain. And we, they really shouldn't be considered open access repositories. Uh, and we know that some researchers have encountered some copyright challenges on these sites. For example, ResearchGate has received several takedown requests from publishers because researchers posted copies of their articles there and these are articles to which they probably already transferred their copyright to the publishers. So publishers typically don't like websites like this, especially considering the, the for-profit nature 
of some of these platforms. Then of course, there are many general purpose social networking sites that are used to share links to research, news, announcements, and blog posts. Some of these sites can be used effectively to communicate with peers and have some discussion, but we know that it takes time and investment in following accounts, building a reputation, responding to comments and replies. Um, so these scholarly and social profiles we covered today are just the tip of the iceberg. And you should do some research as to which are most pertinent to your field and also which you feel comfortable using and investing some time in. Okay, another strategy to become the most important researcher in the entire world is to publish open access. Open access refers to the free immediate online availability of scholarship. Um, often that definition is expanded to also mean the availability of scholarship to be reused and remixed without restrictions on copyright and licensing. In other words, true open access is not just about being able to view something online, but also having the legal rights to share and reuse the work because it's been released under an open license like a Creative Commons license. These types of licenses give permission in advance to others to copy, share, and incorporate that content into their own work. Just as a side reminder, this week is Open Access Week, um, which is an annual global week of education and advocacy in support of improved access to research around the world. But we would be telling you to publish open access anyway. So why, why would we be telling you that? Why is moving to open access increasingly important uh, to becoming the most powerful uh, researcher in the world? Well, most of the scholarship that's published today is published in journals that charge libraries and readers a huge amount of money and subscriptions. Actually, throw out some numbers in the chat of what you think our library pays every year to get you access to read journals. Just for the, just for the Berkeley campus. Yeah, do you want to know how many? Sharifa is close. We, it used to be 20 million and um, because of budget cuts, we were now slashed down to between 16 and 17 million. $17 million every single year to get just Berkeley users access to read journals. Of course, not all universities have this kind of money and not all universities can pay for their scholars to have access to, to read these, this content. So if you are publishing in a journal that charges that, you are almost certainly not going to be read at a majority of institutions around the world that cannot afford to get access to this content. And as I mentioned, our own university's budget is continually shrinking. Now, you might think access is free because when you log in or when you go online and you click a link, magically the content appears but it's because we've paid for access to, to it. So um, don't think, oh, it's, everything is free. No, and, and in fact, most people can't read it if you've published in, in a closed or subscription access journal. What's also great about open access is that it can increase the readership for your scholarship. It can easily be seen not just by people at other institutions, but the public and policymakers. So if you're looking to be able to influence real world change, the more that civic leaders can actually, or journalists can actually read and access your content, the more they can share and cite and discuss it and the more impact it can have overall. Now there are different flavors of open access. Um, this might seem a little strange to be talking about, but I, I think it's an opportunity. People don't really necessarily understand how journal scholarship is, is paid for and how the publishing process works, where, where the money goes. Um, so it's, it's useful to take a look at the different flavors of open access so you can understand um, the entire process. One flavor of open access is called green open access. And it's basically you take a copy of your journal article, a particular version of your journal article, and you put it in an institutional repository. Sometimes you're only allowed to do that after a publisher's embargo is over. So let's say the, the journal article comes out and then the, the um, publisher says, wait 12 months, and then you can put a copy of, your, of it into a repository. 
the University of California, we have an institutional open access policy that applies to all of the UC authors and requires that your work is made available immediately upon publication in a journal. So what that means is you are automatically authorized under the UC open access policy to post a certain version of your scholarly articles in the UC repository, which is called e-scholarship. What version though? What version matters? It's the version that is your final peer reviewed but not publisher formatted version of your article. And this is sometimes called a postprint or an author accepted manuscript. Problem is you keep those around. Do you have a peer reviewed version of your article that has gone through all of the changes from, um, you know, from peer review, but just simply has not been put into nice, pretty journal format by the publisher? Many people do not. <laughs> um, the good thing about institutional repositories, though, is that they do also help preserve your research. It's going to be there forever because the library and the UC cares about keeping good archives. And you can also deposit different things there, including not just journal articles, but working papers, your thesis and dissertation, capstone projects, and other materials. Also, what's great is that content posted to eScholarship can get a DOI, and that digital object identifier that we mentioned earlier ensures an unambiguous pointer to that scholarly resource over time. There's another type of open access called gold open access, and this type of open access charges a publication fee to you as an author and sometimes also to the library in order to get subscription access to the journal. So if it's pure gold open access, meaning there isn't also a subscription to the journal, in those instances, authors would be asked to pay a fee to publish in lieu of a subscription being charged to the library. If you're not aware of this already, uh, our library has a fund called Berkeley Research Impact Initiative or BRI, which will cover those costs for you of publishing in a fully open access journal. So if you are being asked to pay $2,500 for an article processing charge or an author processing charge to publish in a fully open access journal, we will cover that for you. Another thing we're doing is at, at the system system-wide level is entering into what are called transformative agreements with publishers, um, which will allow UC authors very much like the Bree program to have the article processing charge covered by the library, either at no or low cost to the researcher, while also simultaneously giving all of campus access to um, the, the publisher's journals. We've already signed these kinds of agreements with Cambridge University Press, um, Public Library of Science, Springer Nature, ACM. One thing to note is that open access policies are being implemented by funding organizations too. So you need to check to make sure whether your grants also require that you publish your article open access. Now, I said earlier that um, there are two types of gold open access. Um, one in which the, the journal is already entirely open access, and another in which essentially the journal double dipping. They are asking you to pay an article processing charge while also charging us to, to make a copy or a version of your article available open access, while also charging us subscription fees for the rest of the content in the journal that's not open access. And that's a universe that we're trying to get away from. It's difficult because the profit margins for commercial publishers like Elsevier are 40%, which by the way, is the highest of any kind of profit margins anywhere, much higher than Apple. In order for a business to just survive, they only need a 10% profit margin, so. Okay, one thing we might want to ask ourselves um, as we consider publishing open access is, is there actually a citation advantage? Um, that is, are scientific papers that are published open access cited more than those published in paywall journals? There have been many research studies on this and the results vary depending on the methodology um, for example, one recent study showed an 8% open access citation advantage. Another showed a 40% advantage after a sample of over a million articles. 
Um, this is sort of the e-commerce problem. At, at some point, if everything is open, there will not be an open access citation advantage in the same way that e-commerce is just commerce now. Um, but it's it's good to know that in this transition period, yes, there there have been many studies that that demonstrate an open access citation advantage. In fact, Spark um, used to track various studies which analyzed them and found that 46 studies found a citation advantage to publishing OA. 17 didn't and seven were inconclusive, but the majority of studies show um, a, a notable open access citation advantage. So where, what can we do from here? We've talked about publishing academic articles, probably some of the main scholarly outputs that you'll be expected to contribute to in your field. What other things can you do besides you know, Tim talked about making a, a research um, and dissemination plan for yourself. I've talked about open access. You can also think beyond the article to other types of resources that you can share to help build your scholarly per persona and build impact for the articles that you do publish. And we're also gonna take a look at some tactics and practices you can experiment with to make your research more accessible to a wider variety of audiences. And to do this, we need to think beyond the article. One thing you can do is publish your research data on Dryad or your code and software on GitHub or put your presentations on SlideShare or Figshare. If you start showing the, the world your many different kinds of research outputs that reference the body of work you're doing, you're going to draw more attention to the body of work that you're doing. Um, it not only helps to contribute more knowledge to the field, but it helps you get exposure for your work and will, can help increase your citation rates down the line. You do not have to wait until you have a final publication to get to start getting the word out about what you're doing. Discussing what's in progress can help build interest in your work. This is where working papers and preprints come in. Preprints are another increasingly important way that scholars stake out a research question or invite collaboration and get early feedback on their work. A preprint is a version of a paper that comes before peer review and before obviously formal publication in a scholarly journal. Preprints by no means are new, right? Archive is a preprint server for math and physics. It's been running since 1991. It's common in, in fields like physics to post early articles there. And as of 2016, they were getting 10,000 submissions of preprints per month. But preprints are not just for the physical sciences. Preprint servers have taken off for all sorts of academic disciplines from social and behavioral sciences to arts and humanities to law. There's a lot of fear about, at least we've found with uh, early career researchers, People fear getting scooped in your research, um, especially if you're waiting around for months or years for a scholarly journal to accept your publication. Well, sharing a preprint can be one way to alleviate these fears. You stake out your research idea through sharing a preprint. And that way your name gets out there as a researcher on that particular topic. And perhaps you can even get comments or feedback from your peers or others interested in the work that will improve it for when you're ready to formally publish in a peer reviewed journal. Earth Archive is a preprint server that was recently transitioned actually to being hosted by the University of California through California, UC's California Digital Library. Okay, this is my favorite thing to encourage people to do. It's also kind of the most uncomfortable and sometimes goofy, goofiest piece of this, but it must be done. You can build up readership around your work by developing multiple pieces on your topic that are intended for different outlets. So Ava asked um, you know, how to do both the private work and the public work at the same time. Unfortunately, that means having a bunch of spinning plates, but that's really kind of what we need to do to really build up our profile. So you can do everything from real life spaces like conferences and poster sessions to virtual spaces like social media and email lists. All of these are opportunities to find out what other people are working on and to get your name and research out there. If you are not so active on social media, but you think it could be a good avenue to share your research, 
start following some researchers in your field and see how they're using social media and figure out what you like and don't like about what they're doing and what feels comfortable and doesn't feel comfortable for you. Twitter hashtags are used extensively around conferences for major research projects and in things like open access publishing. So these Twitter hashtags and Twitter threads for uh, the person who, who just started using it have been a really important way to capture related conversations. So in addition to following particular researchers in your space, you can also start following threads um, by following particular Twitter hashtags in the research areas you're interested in. Another way to promote your work and put another spinning plate in the air is to create research summaries that you can post on your personal website or your department site or one of the discipline specific scholarly platforms we mentioned earlier. You've written a journal article, well, spread the word about it with, by supplementing it with a blog post. Um, that is attracting a potentially much greater audience and a different audience than readers who are you know, inherently interested in, in your topic. You, you're expanding the universe of people who might be able to read and cite you, especially if you've published in a closed access journal. There's nothing to prevent you from writing a research summary or a blog post that talks about that research, um, that, that it will ex expand your reach to people who otherwise wouldn't have access in, because they can't afford to read it. Here's the takeaway. Do not just publish and walk away. You have so many opportunities to invite and engage others to better understand and collaborate with you. And if you are a bold person and want to take things to various extremes, here are some other examples. So this researcher and, and Ava, you had asked what other kinds of what public strategies there are. Well, Here's something you can do. This, this researcher from Connecticut broadcast her availability as a neighborhood squid expert. So uh, a young girl noticed the advertisement on her car and got in touch with her. And this tweet went viral. Does this mean that everyone should drive around with their car advertising their research specialty and that that is the key to success? Probably not, but if your goal is building an audience and getting more visibility beyond just the people who can afford to read your research, this is certainly one creative way to go about it. And again, impact building strategies are very individualized. So you don't need to necessarily go to this extreme, but it helps kind of get the juices flowing to think about ways that you can communicate and communicate in more than just one way. I like this example because it shows you don't need much to get started. I have to share this. Last week, someone discovered that a person had arranged for a QR code linking to their publications to be put on their gravestone. Now, you definitely do not need to go this far, but again, the point is test out the different communication channels, find the ones that are most relevant um, and, and that feel comfortable to you. If you follow the thread for this tweet, they actually um, post the image of the gravestone as well if you want to actually check out the QR code and, and read this person's publications. Thanks, Rachel. So finally, it's important for you to be able to assess and evaluate your own impact. Um, is your dissemination actions, are they making a difference? Are they helping you accomplish your goals? So in order to know what worked and which strategies did not generate the desired outcomes, all of the activities should be assessed. And you can assess against the variety of metrics we talked about in the first half of the workshop. And these can give some quantitative measures of impact, such as how many times your article is being cited or how many mentions it has received in blog posts and social media. You could also consider qualitative measures to assess your progress and to see where you can improve. Um, you can do this through questionnaires, through interviews or discussions with colleagues, and collecting other observations that you make along the way. So taking into account various types of measures, you can see which strategies have been most effective in actually reaching your audience. Then you can reuse the tools and tactics that worked and change course and experiment with others for next time for making a bigger impact. So let's review a few things you might consider that you can do right now. 
So some of these might only take a few minutes like signing up for an ORCID ID, uh, setting up your Google Scholar profile, uh, doing a scan for open access journals in your field, um, following some fellow scholars on social media, um, and seeing where you might volunteer even to review a journal article that's within your discipline. Then of course, some things you might want to slot into a longer term schedule. Uh, these could include things like posting a preprint of an article that you're working on. Um, and then, you know, once you've got something published in a journal, you know, being sure that it's added to the UC's e-scholarship repository, um, you could write out several tweets or Facebook posts talking about an article you published and schedule them around when the article is meant to be released. Uh, you could summarize your research for a lay audience by publishing a blog post and linking to the article and other related research. And then finally, you could submit a proposal to give a conference presentation or a poster session on your research. So we hope that these metrics, you know, platforms and advice on increasing your scholarly impact have been helpful. Um, so we're going to stop the recording now and open it up to questions in the chat. And of course, any that you'd like to ask us live, we're happy to do that as well. And I will get started.